Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you've had a good lunch. Um, and thank you to the Seth Hadeka and to Leah and the whole team for organizing this wonderful event. Um, I'm going to be speaking about uh, something I've been exploring over the last 10 years. I've been working in participatory media production. And I've been working primarily with digital storytelling. And when I talk about digital storytelling, I'm referring to the Berkeley model. Around 20 years ago, when um, video editing became readily accessible and affordable and portable, um, an organization called the Story Center, at the time called the Center for Digital Storytelling, began using digital storytelling in community contexts as a way of learning about diverse communities and creating platforms for diverse stories. And I have been engaging with digital storytelling, kind of experimenting, changing the model, uh, seeing how it can be a research method, a research, a form of inquiry in and of itself, and a form of engagement and at times intervention. And I'm going to be showing you three examples of stories from three very different contexts. Um, with three different storytellers and three different approaches to uh, a story. But I'm hoping that with these examples, you'll have a sense of the form itself and its limitations and its strengths. I want to begin by placing myself in relation to this research. Is it more ordinary to forget or to remember? Again, we land and take the same photograph. Beyond shutters, colored sorbet melted to earth, the alpine range presses down. The pluck of scaffolding, workers' hands, hope between seasons. Locals walk their dogs alone, no need to smile for strangers. They keep to their own mountain midline. Nervous as wind, goats twitch and munch, sounding bells that soften worry. The bells say, not all distance feels far. You are not too small to survive. Every day now she runs toward her daughter, the voice of her infant son gathering with birds and snow. Here she forgets what staying will cost. At the center of my practice as an audiovisual anthropologist, writing poetry is a means of compassionate critical engagement with memory, migration, violence, and loss. Both the process of crafting the artifact and the artifact itself reveal pathways for inquiry. Building on Carolyn Forche's concept of the poem as evidence and trace, I developed this approach as a response to an ongoing aftermath of trauma. Before completing my PhD in Europe in 2015, I worked in El Salvador as an interpreter and human rights investigator with the Salvadoran Association for Disappeared Children, Probúsqueda and later as an adult educator in the Mexico-US borderlands. Jason de Leon names this region the land of open graves. It is simultaneously a scene of crimes against humanity, a site of ambiguous loss for the family members of the disappeared, and the sacred homeland of the Tohono O'odham people. Witnessing war, the upheaval of family separation, and the increasing militarization of the border created significant silences within me. As I followed the traces of these silences, poetry provided a form of engagement and accompaniment. Poetry offered both an act of recognition and a strategy to represent violence in a way that, as John Berger wrote, shelters the experience of the storyteller. He continues, poems, regardless of any outcome, cross the battlefields, tending to the wounded, listening to the wild monologues of the triumphant and the fearful. They bring a kind of peace, not the anesthesia or easy reassurance, but by recognition and the promise that what has been experienced cannot disappear as if it had never happened. Yet the promise is not of a monument, who, after all, still on a battlefield, wants monuments. The promise is that language has acknowledged, has given shelter to the experience, which demanded which cried out. Following Berger's lead, I have employed poetry in my audiovisual research 
with asylum seekers, refugees, and undoc undocumented migrants in Europe. In this ethnographic multimodal practice, I design co-creative seminars for research participants to develop short documentary essays. These essays are animated with letters home, still and moving image, poetry, and spoken word. This form of exchange draws inspiration from the work of artists including Donna de Cesare, Patricio Guzman, Susan Meseles, and Teju Cole. And all, all four of those artists feel comfortable, they feel at home both in the spoken and written word and in the moving and still image. The work is, I like to think of it as first person plural because in the workshop sites in, that I develop and design with research participants. I develop and design the research site um, in response to the particular circumstances and needs of the research participants. And I think of it as first, pers first person plural because each individual research participant creates a story based on an experience, a lived, in, a lived experience, a question, uh, a particular argument they want to make, and they create this story in collectivity with others. We create a, a working environment, a community of learners, where people can workshop their ideas and think through making. Spurgeon, um, uh, Christina Spurgeon, Jean, uh, Jean Burgess, Tanya Drehar, these are some of the media uh, theorists in Australia who use the term co-creative, uh, many people use the term co-creative nowadays, but when I'm thinking of co-creative, I'm thinking specifically of the work of this body of media theorists in Australia who have been looking at digital storytelling and bring co-creative back into the room as reminding us that it's not just about the technique or the technology, but it's about the process itself. And I want to begin by showing you one of the first stories and this is a project that was a longitudinal project. I mentioned it in the opening where I was working with asylum seekers and refugees and undocumented migrants. So people with diverse legal status in relation to the Irish state. And it was a multi-year project. I was working with two Irish NGOs and then also with a university institution called the Forum on Migration and Communications. And this story was created by Joyce Akpotar. She is from the Akwa Ibom region in Nigeria. And she was a community journalist in her, neighbor, in her uh, hometown. And she came to Ireland seeking asylum and lived in one of the asylum centers. Um, sociologist Ronit Lenton has called the asylum centers throughout Ireland holding centers and sites of deportability. A number of sociologists and other researchers in Ireland have looked at the ways in which these centers isolate people who are legally present in the country, economically and socially and politically. And Joyce was very new to making images. In fact, all of the images you're going to see now, she made on her cell phone. And it was her very first time of working with moving image, of thinking about how to animate her ideas. But as a writer, she felt fairly confident and she wanted to focus on a story that was one day of, of her life or one day of life in the asylum center. <laughs> All the build up and then no story. I woke up this morning with a bit of hot head and shivers, even though the room was heated. It is one of those days in Ireland when the sky empties her icy grains. Going to the GP is out of the question. I have seen him five times in one month. I know this is the pulse of frustration, whose height can't be measured nor bounds determined by a mere stethoscope. This is my third year in the direct provision hostel, and I have learned that asylum seekers visit the GP four times more frequently than normal Irish people. The pressure in here is so high that everybody seems to be furious over little things. If you ask me, I would say most of our ailments are stress-related. 
I look up. It's for me. Not again. It is her fifth year in the hostel, so she's a bag of trouble. Being a member of the resident committee, I am confronted with all kinds of situations. Most times, I get so furious about who to direct my anger at. Is it the asylum system that piles up people together for years in idleness? Or are greedy country leaders who send their youth scrambling for safety? Despite my headache, I can't sell for me. Just then, Caroline burst into my room, raging, swearing and cursing. What again? I ask. Do you know that my solicitor said my case would be great if I wasn't a Nigerian? I stare at her, wondering how my country got to be a sinful nation in the eyes of the world. Fool me, fool me, fool me. I can hear the lady in room 10 calling out. You have a registered post. There is a drop-in silence. This is one moment that every asylum seeker dreads. It is the decider. Either you are in or you are out. We all cluster around for me. Her heartbeat vibrating like a Nokia phone. After five stressful years, Fumi received her leave to remain. What a situation. Five years of being on the waiting line and one minute of crossing over. So, Joyce, the ending line is five years of being on the waiting line and one minute of crossing over. And in the story, Fumi receives humanitarian leave to remain. Um, I realize I need to make subtitles for, for the story so that you can understand all the detail of the story itself that was created. Joyce made that piece in a period, we worked together for a period of four months. We met every week for two to four hours at the media center. And then I actually went to the asylum centers as well and worked with research participants outside of um, the workshop site. So the workshop site served as a gateway to uh, meet with research participants uh, in their homes and in different institutions and workplaces. And it really came from their invitation to come and to collaborate with them. As I mentioned, all of the images Joyce made herself. And then we worked together. So she completed the project to the point where all of her images were synced on the timeline. The sound was synced. And then we began to discuss the animation and the different changes that she wanted to include in the video. Um, we also added uh, sound, different sound effects as well afterwards in post-production in collaboration with her. So all of that is to say that research participants were seen as co-producers in the project and as emergent media producers, not just as storytellers, but as emergent media producers. So therefore, we created an environment where people were learning about film production, video production, storytelling, uh, photography, um, the performance of the voiceover. And this is from the Media Lab in Dublin where um, the story was produced. So now I want to go into the second context, which is a governmental context. And this is a series of stories. We created about 50 digital stories from within the DEDSA, the SDC, uh, and the EDA. So the Swiss government came to me and said, Kuno Schleffli very concretely came to me and said that they were very interested in democratizing their internal communication within um, the SDC. And they wanted to begin exploring the possibilities of digital storytelling, other forms of sharing information within the organization. And I'm going to show you a story that Kuno created. And you'll see a very different visual language. Um, and you'll notice that Kuno is very comfortable with photography. In 2014, I spent a week in a Roma ghetto in Bulgaria to report on a planned SDC project with the municipality of Sliven. People told me that the ghetto is increasingly isolated from the rest of the city. The divide between the Bulgarian 
and the Roma societies deepens over time and prejudice increase. The chairperson of the Roma Academy for Culture and Education, Stella Kostova, told me that a large part of the Bulgarian community believes that the Roma would easily be integrated if they just adopted the Bulgarian culture. But for Stella, this is assimilation. For her, integration means preserving identity, language and traditions. Where is our Roman theater? I can't. Where is our Roman culture? It's gone. And the most important thing that is held up as an ethnic Езика ни. Езика ни се отива всеки един Божи ден, защото никъде не се учи ромски език, никъде не се учи за ромска култура, никъде не се учи ромски фулклор. Къде е нашата история? Under that external pressure, the values regulating relationships in the Roma society fade away. The people are losing their self-esteem. Some groups with more resources exploit the real powerless. Very strange customs appear, which are difficult to understand, like the custom of abducting girls at a very young age. Sofia Ivanova told me, I have a daughter who was taught from the first to the eighth class. И тя много добре се развиваше и ние с моя съпруг се много радвахме за нея, че тя продължава да учи. Но един ден, когато отиваше да учи фризорско, когато по пътя едно семейство, майка и син, я откраднаха. Тя беше непълнолетна, тя беше 15 годишна. И аз тогава отидах в полицията и казах на господата полицаи, че я откраднаха. The police found her and brought her back to her mother, but then Sofia married her daughter at the age of 15 to avoid that she be stolen again. That was the end of her daughter's education. During my visit, one night on our way home, close to midnight, the person who accompanied us stopped in front of a garage door and opened it. Inside, an old man was sitting, smoking and drinking Rocky. We were invited to join him, and after a few minutes, the old man sent the boy out with a message. Minutes later, a group of boys entered the garage with their instruments. And soon, we enjoyed a full brass band concert at midnight in the midst of the ghetto. The old man actually was a trumpet player who used to tour with the famous Goran Bregovic band. Now he trains these youngsters who are between 12 and 18 years old. And they are very proud to have tour engagements all over Europe. Did you know that between 50 and 100,000 Roma from the Balkans live in Switzerland? They are registered as Serbs, Kosovars, Croats or Bosnians. They don't disclose their Roma identity because they fear disadvantages and prejudice. So you see in that um, digital story, Kuno is engaging with um, He's an amateur photographer, he loves photography, and he uses photography a lot in his work. So he was able to do short clips and interviews with the people that he was making the short film about, or the short digital story, and he intercuts this with the, with the photo film. And for Kuno, um, as I, so for the first participant, the image making was very challenging, and the engagement with the thinking through what wanted to be said was very, was much more accessible to Joyce. And for Kuno, the photography and the visual language was very accessible, but he really struggled about what he wanted to say concretely with the experiences. And so both of these, all three of the shorts that I will show you, for me represent the ways in which in, we can, this, this way of working with people is really about creating objects of thought, of thinking about how the image making 
the script writing and the um, uh, editing itself, you know, completing the final object, the final artifact, these are all aspects of thinking through making and a part of the dialogical inquiry process. The last film, uh, the last short uh, digital story that I want to sh share with you is a piece that was made by Delphine Magara. And when she made this, she was a first year uh, social anthropology student. And it's a piece that she wrote about her experiences thinking through why uh, she was interested in studying anthropology. When I was seven, my father moved away. When I was 17, my sister moved away. When I was 19, my mother moved away. And I stayed because this place had become my nest. I made some attempts to leave traveling to different places where I experienced other realities. In Nicaragua, people drink bottled Fanta sitting under mango trees surrounded by trash. In the refugee camp of Thessaloniki, people worry about bad Wi-Fi while there is not enough water. In Nepal, families living in the mountains have a television but hardly own anything else. Whenever I reach a new place, the pictures are either blurred such that I can't see clearly, or they're too sharp, such that I'm blinded and I don't want to see. It is as if I wore another pair of glasses according to where I go. And with time, a new space opens up, bringing a realization about my surrounding while discovering something new inside of me. I've learned that Nicaraguans are not ignorant about pollution, but they were only used to organic waste until 20 years ago. Cheap plastic packaging arrived without any possibility of recycling it. I've realized that for a boy who fled from war, Hearing his mother say hello on the phone seems more important than having food and drink. And I've seen that a family living in the Himalayas wants to know what is going on in the world as they live so far away from those scenes of action. When I come back from traveling, my perspective on reality is changed. A strong feeling of alienation overcomes me, as if I had lived in a bubble that has just burst. All I see are never-ending construction sites, touch screens and concrete blocks, and pharmacies advertising for medicines against fatigue and anxiety next to weight loss pills. While having breakfast, I hear the radio presenter talking about the famine in southern Sudan and then immediately switching to the weather forecast. Overwhelmed by information and questions, I get lost between the familiarity of this place and the disorientation about the role I am supposed to play here. Where is home? Where everything is normal and stays unquestioned? Is it because my family is so scattered that I can't find my nest anymore? As my view blurs and darkens, I give up and take these glasses off. I struggle to create new ones for this known place that has lost its simplicity to my eyes. Maybe home is not just a place. Maybe it's not only family. 
It might be an inner process, influenced by experiences of the outside, sometimes clashing against each other, bringing turbidity and confusion, and sometimes flowing in the same direction, giving clarity and transparency. So the last uh, film from the university context was from, well, actually, maybe I'll do this here first, sorry. Um, the last film, Delphine's uh, digital story, was created within the university context at the University of Bern. And this, this course, I've taught the course twice now, and students really appreciate engaging with um, photography, film, drawing, um, different sensory modes as a way to explore theoretical uh, approaches. It, they really like the fact that it's hands-on and provides them, as I said, a very concrete way of thinking about theory in anthropology. So in their scripts, they discuss with one another the edits and how they will change and shift the story. And some people choose to begin first with the visual elements. Some people begin with the written element. It depends on each individual uh, storyteller. And I want to end with uh, how I, I want to uh, give a book, a book end to the beginning of the presentation. I started with a quote from Hannah Arendt. I didn't read it to you, but it was on the screen. And I want to end with one of her students, the anthropologist Michael Jackson. Um, I imagine some of you are familiar with his book, The Politics of Storytelling. And I think that his ideas about storytelling as a dialogical process, as an important means for externalizing internal elements, is very helpful for audiovisual research, in particular, um, participatory media. And he says, to reconstitute events in a story is no longer to live those events in passivity, but to actively rework them, both in dialogue with others and within one's own imagination. Thank you. A number of the stories are available on the website if you want to look at them. Maybe, how do you turn the lights on? Oh. Is it Einlass? Uh, no? This one? I, this one's great. Yay, now I can see you. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much, Dorsey, for these really nice inputs on the use of audiovisual um, tools, in, um, especially in anthropology, social anthropology. Um, do you have questions or reflections? Yes. Hi, uh, thank you for your insights. Um, I'm wondering how you structured that course at university where you had people work with video who maybe didn't have much experience before with it. Um, I'm wondering this because I had the pleasure to tutor a course at the uh, Hochschule Luzern for social work and um, I had to be very careful to not go too far um, because there were very different levels. Yes, we have very different levels as well. There, I would say in the, the, the two times I've taught the course I would have maybe three students who were familiar with working with videos and cameras, who felt very confident as visual storytellers, but the majority of the students were really quite new to visual storytelling. And I think that, you know, we're consuming visual images all the time, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're critical consumers. And so I think that that's another element of the workshop as well, of really getting students to think critically about, about image making and seeing themselves as image makers. Um, structuring the course, we, I, I do it, um, the beginning of the course is more focused on theory and sto theories around storytelling, ethnographic work, participatory media. I give them a lot of different inputs of photo films primarily, so very short pieces. We also do some, I also will take in radio work as well, so that they're thinking about how stories are structured. Um, and then about halfway through the semester, they begin producing. 
um, developing their script, their storyboard, and thinking about um, the audio inputs as well. And so there's a lot of hands-on tutorial that we do in the workshop, in the seminar. And then at the end of the seminar, we have the screening. And with these stories, the second series, they screen them at the right, right hall, no, is that right? Right hall, thank you. Um, in Bern uh, for the student film festival or student film series called um, Ethno Kino. And that was very exciting. They had their families and community members and fellow colleagues, fellow students come to see their, their productions. More questions? Um, I have maybe one question. Uh, maybe you can explain how you see um, creative work is seen by academia in general, mm -hmm. by uh, the universities. How is it, um, is creative work as you do in different um, sectors mm -hmm. is uh, perceived by um, quite strict academia and academic system? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good question, and it's an ongoing conversation that's happening. I think that I was just at the American Anthropological Association meetings in November, and it was incredible because I really had the sense of a fairly significant shift. There was so much interest in multimodal anthropology, and it's been, it's a, it's a very old discussion in many ways. You know yourself, uh, uh, having studied visual anthropology for your MA, um, they're very old debates about what is legitimate and what is scientific and what is not and what is artistic. And I think that there seems to be greater interest um, with having fewer binaries and understanding continuums better. I think that's what I would say. I think one thing that continues to be important is, at least in anthropology, is that yes, we need to be publishing written papers. And I love writing. I think that for me, I learn in a different way through writing than I learn through filming. I, I think both of these things are really important to, to the way I do scholarship. So that's not a problem. But I think um, for people who really are, who really struggle with writing, I actually think we need to provide more services for our students to, to become stronger writers and to overcome their fears around writing. And I think that that's something that this course also offers, strangely enough, to students, is kind of a different inroad into writing. And gaining confidence in a first-person narrative I've seen with Delphine very concretely has helped her to gain confidence in more um, standard, if you will, scientific text. So that's something to think about. Thank you. More questions? I mean, it's very short. Uh, consciousness, what's the role of, it, of this word? Oh, I don't it? know. <laughs> what's the role of consciousness? Well, I think of it maybe very pragmatically. And for me, it's about being an ethical practitioner with my research participants and really listening deeply to what it is they want to say and what their concerns are. And having an inroad, being able to follow their lead, if you will, or meeting each other halfway. So it's kind of going back to um, what Raphael discussed in the morning of the 50-50. And uh, I think maybe that's how I would understand understand it. And then in terms of poetry and filmmaking, I'm, I'm not, uh, that's not in my pay scale to tell you the answer. We can talk about it over coffee, maybe. One question there? Um, thank you very much for your talk, and uh, I wonder, because um, as you were showing these films, they are more or less, you could say, a form of data production for research. So you, 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 you ask the people you, or the context you want to study to produce film. So we are not publishing yourself in the context of film, right? Uh, to bridge that, I wonder if you look to these films, um, are there things that you cannot describe by words? So, you know, like if you look to films, is that kind of a category of studying this material? Um, to, uh, to yeah, t a certain form of speechlessness that could be the gate for yeah. uh, bridging it also as part in, uh, of your publication? 
Yeah, I'm very interested in that question. I'm, I'm very interested in speechlessness, and I'm, I personally, as a, as a viewer of films and a lover of films, I love to see films where there are no words. I like to simply be able to visually experience a film. But in, these, in this work, very concretely, because I'm working with people who are absolute, the vast majority are absolute novices and new to the form, um, the word making, the, the engagement, the relationship between spoken and non-spoken has been very important. So I don't know. I think I would need to go back and look at the entire body of work to be able to answer that question, but I like the question. Um, I think also it's important to remember we have, so the first series of stories, the story that Joyce made, Crossing Over, they, this body of participants created over 250 images, and then we created 15 digital stories, so 15 documentary essay shorts. And really, it's also about the body itself. I talked about first person plural. It's also about the ways in which these pieces speak to one another and the questions that arise in conversation between the pieces. And this is something that I've, that I've written about and, and worked through in my, in my own scholarship in relation to the work. But the stories have, have traveled to documentary film festivals and they've screened um, in different contexts. They had their premiere screening at the Irish Film Institute and then they also screened before uh, policy, policy people, immigration policy uh, what, decision makers. And this was something that the research participants themselves decided. So the other thing is I didn't tell them what stories to make. I didn't say, I want you to write a story about living in the asylum center. I want you to write a story about going to the pub in Dundalk or whatever. It really is a process of creating a platform and a situation where people can begin to consider what it is that they want to say. And the majority of the stories were really speaking to an Irish audience. So yeah, I'd have to look closely for the speechlessness, but it's there. One last question. Yeah. Um, if we speak about speechlessness, maybe I'm very interested in uh, invisibility. So how would you deal with invisibilities in visual anthropology? Yes, that was an important question for us in, in, all, in, the, in both of the two series, the longitudinal series with undocumented migrants and asylum seekers because the majority of people chose to be visually invisible. Um, and if you remember the very first image I showed, this image here, um, one of the ways around not being physically present in the video was to draw the story. So this was Zef, a lawyer from the Dominican Republic of, not the Dominican Republic, from the DR Congo. And he and his daughter worked together in creating drawings that visually told the story that he was not able to be physically present for. And this is an ongoing question of how visible can I be? Do I want to be visible? Can I be visible? And this was an ongoing ethical question to consider with research participants. And this was Zeph's way of getting around it. I, I also, you also make me think of another issue that emerges is the question of community as well. And uh, as a first series of stories, I said it's a community context, but interestingly enough, people living in the asylum system did not necessarily have much of a sense of community because they were living in very um, debilitating circumstances. So the research site, the workshop space, the act of creating things together really enabled the possibility of creating some semblance of a community. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>